Preface. The object of this volume is to place before the general reader our early poetic masterpiece, The Canterbury Tales, to do so in a way that will render its popular perusal easy in a time of little leisure and unbounded temptations to intellectual languor. The Canterbury Tales, so far as they are in verse, have been printed without any abridgment or designed change in the sense. But the two tales in prose, Chaucer's tale of Melibius and the parson's long sermon on penitence, have been contracted so as to exclude thirty pages of unattractive prose. The gaps thus made in the prose tales, however, are supplied by careful outlines of the omitted matter, so that the reader need be at no loss to comprehend the whole scope and sequence of the original. As regards the manner in which the text is presented, the editor is aware that some whose judgment is weighty will differ from him. This volume has been prepared for popular perusal, and its very raison d'être would have failed if the ancient orthography had been retained. It has often been affirmed by editors of Chaucer in the old forms of the language that a little trouble at first would render the antiquated spelling and obsolete inflections a continual source not of difficulty but of actual delight, for the reader coming to the study of Chaucer without any preliminary acquaintance with the English of his day, or of his copyist's days. Despite this complacent assurance, the obvious fact is that Chaucer in the old forms has not become popular in the true sense of the word. He is not understanded of the vulgar. In this volume, therefore, the text of Chaucer has been presented in 19th century garb. But there has been not the slightest attempt to modernize Chaucer in the wider meaning of the phrase, to replace his words by words which he did not use, or, following the example of some operators, to translate him into English of the modern spirit as well as the modern forms. So far from that, in every case where the old spelling or form seemed essential to meter, to rhyme or to meaning, no change has been attempted. But wherever its preservation was not essential, the spelling of the monkish transcribers, for the most ardent purist, must now despair of getting the spelling of Chaucer himself, has been discarded for that of the reader's own day. It is a poor compliment to the father of English poetry to say that by such treatment the bouquet and individuality of his works must be lost. If his masterpiece is valuable for one thing more than any other, it is the vivid distinctness with which English men and women of the fourteenth century are there painted for the study of all the centuries to follow. But we wantonly balk the artist's own purpose, and discredit his labour when we keep before his picture the screen of dust and cobwebs which, for the English people in these days, the crude forms of the infant language have practically become. Shakespeare has not suffered by similar changes, Spencer has not suffered. It would be surprising if Chaucer should suffer, when the loss of popular comprehension and favour in his case are necessarily all the greater for his remoteness from our day. In his other poems we behold Chaucer as he was, a courtier, a gallant, pure-hearted gentleman, a scholar, a philosopher, a poet of gay and vivid fancy, playing around themes of chivalric convention, of deep human interest, or broad-sighted satire. In the Canterbury Tales we see not Chaucer, but Chaucer's times and neighbours. The artist has lost himself in his work. To show him honestly and without disguise as he lived his own life and sung his own songs at the brilliant court of Edward III is to do his memory a moral justice far more material than any wrong that can ever come out of spelling. From books the editor has derived valuable help, as from Mr. Cowden Clark's revised modern text of the Canterbury Tales published in Mr. Mimo's library edition of the English Poets from Mr. Wright's scholarly edition of the same work, from the indispensable Tyrwit, from Mr. Bell's edition of Chaucer's poem, and from many others. The editor leaves his task with the hope 
that his attempt to remove artificial obstacles to the popularity of one of England's earliest poets will not altogether miscarry. D. Lang Perves End of Preface The Life of Geoffrey Chaucer not in point of genius only, but even in point of time, Chaucer may claim the proud designation of first English poet. He wrote The Court of Love in 1345, and The Romaunt of the Rose, if not also Troilus and Cressida, probably within the next decade. The dates usually assigned to the poems of Laurence Minot extend from 1335 to 1355, while the vision of Piers Plowman mentions events that occurred in 1360 and 1362. Before which date, Chaucer had certainly written The Assembly of Fowls and his Dream. But though they were his contemporaries, neither Minot nor Langland, if Langland was the author of the vision, at all approached Chaucer in the finish of the force, or the universal interest of their works, and the poems of earlier writers, as Lemon and the author of Ormulum are less English than Anglo-Saxon or Anglo-Norman. Those poems reflected the perplexed struggle for supremacy between the two grand elements of our language, which marked the twelfth and thirteenth centuries. A struggle intimately associated with the political relations between the conquering Normans and the subjugated Anglo-Saxons. Chaucer found two branches of the language, that spoken by the people, Teutonic in its genius and its forms, and that spoken by the learned and the noble, based on the French. Yet each branch had begun to borrow of the other, just as nobles and people had been taught to recognize that each needed the other in the wars and the social tasks of the time. And Chaucer, a scholar, a courtier, a man conversant with all orders of society, but accustomed to speak, think, and write in the words of the highest, by his comprehensive genius, cast into the simmering mold a magical amalgamant, which, made of two half-hostile elements, unite and interpenetrate each other. Before Chaucer wrote, there were two tongues in England, keeping alive the feuds and resentments of cruel centuries. When he laid down his pen, there was practically but one speech. There was, and ever since has been, but one people. Geoffrey Chaucer, according to the most trustworthy traditions, for authentic testimonies on the subject are wanting, was born in 1328, and London is generally believed to have been his birthplace. It is true that Leyland, the biographer of England's first great poet who lived nearest to his time, not merely speaks of Chaucer as having been born many years later than the date now assigned, but mentions Berkshire or Oxfordshire as the scene of his birth. So great uncertainty have some felt on the latter score, that elaborate parallels have been drawn between Chaucer and Homer, for whose birthplace several cities contended, and whose descent was traced to the demigods. Leyland may seem to have had fair opportunities of getting at the truth about Chaucer's birth, for Henry the Eighth had him, at the suppression of the monasteries throughout England, to search for records of public interest the archives of the religious houses. But it may be questioned whether he was likely to find many authentic particulars regarding the personal history of the poet in the quarters which he explored, and Leyland's testimony seems to be set aside by Chaucer's own evidence as to his birthplace, and by the contemporary references which make him out an aged man for years preceding the accepted date of his death. In one of his prose works, The Testament of Love, the poet speaks of himself in terms that strongly confirm the claim of London to the honor of giving him birth, for he there mentions the city of London that is to me so dear and sweet in which I was forth growed and more kindly love, says he, have I to that place than to any other in earth, as every kindly creature hath full appetite to that place of his kindly engenderer, and will rest and peace in that place to abide. This tolerably direct evidence is supported, so far as can be at such an interval of time, by the learned Camden, 
In his Annals of Queen Elizabeth, he describes Spencer, who was certainly born in London, as being a fellow citizen of Chaucer's, Edmundus Spencerus, patria Londinesis, Musius Adeo Aridindibus Natus, ut omnis Anglicos superiosus, avi poetas, ne Chaucero quidem concibe excepto supranet. The records of the time notice more than one person of the name of Chaucer who held honorable positions about the court, and though we cannot distinctly trace the poet's relationship with any of these namesakes or antecessors, we find excellent ground of belief that his family or friends stood well at court, in the ease with which Chaucer made his way there, and in his subsequent career. Like his great successor, Spencer, it was the fortune of Chaucer to live under a splendid, chivalrous, and high-spirited reign. 1328 was the second year of Edward the Third, and, what with Scotch wars, French expeditions, and the strenuous and costly struggle to hold England in a worthy place among the states of Europe, there was sufficient bustle, bold achievement, and high ambition in the period to inspire a poet who was prepared to catch the spirit of the day. It was an age of elaborate courtesy, of high-paced gallantry, of courageous venture, of noble disdain for mean tranquillity, and Chaucer, on the whole a man of peaceful avocations, was penetrated to the depth of his consciousness with the lofty and lovely civil side of that brilliant and restless military period. No record of his youthful years, however, remains to us. If we believe that on the age of eighteen he was a student at Cambridge, it is only on the strength of a reference in his Court of Love, where the narrator is made to say that his name is Philogenet of Cambridge Clerk. While he had already told us that when he stirred to seek the court of Cupid, he was at eighteen year of age. According to Leyland, however, he was educated at Oxford, proceeding thence to France and the Netherlands to finish his studies, but there remains no certain evidence of his having belonged to either university. At the same time, it is not doubted that his family was of good condition, and whether or not we accept the assertion that his father held the rank of knighthood, rejecting the hypothesis that made him a merchant or a vintner at the corner of Curtain Lane, it is plain from Chaucer's whole career that he had introductions to public life and recommendations to courtly favor wholly independent of his genius. We have the clearest testimony that his mental training was of wide range and thorough excellence, although rare for a mere courtier in those days. His poems attest his intimate acquaintance with the divinity, the philosophy, and the scholarship of his time, and show him to have had the sciences, as then developed and taught, at his fingers' ends. Another proof of Chaucer's good birth and fortune would be found in the statement that, after his university career was completed, he entered the inner temple, the expenses of which could be borne only by men of noble and opulent families. But although there is a story that he was once fined two shillings for thrashing a Franciscan friar in Fleet Street, we have no direct authority for believing that the poet devoted himself to the uncongenial study of the law. No special display of knowledge on that subject appears in his works, yet in the sketch of the Mansible, in the prologue to the Canterbury Tales, may be found indications of his familiarity with the internal economy of the inns of court. While numerous legal phrases and references hint that his comprehensive information was not at fault on legal matters. Leyland says that he quitted the university a ready logician, a smooth rhetorician, a pleasant poet, a grave philosopher, an ingenious mathematician, and a holy divine, and by all accounts, when Geoffrey Chaucer comes before us authentically for the first time, at the age of thirty-one, he was possessed of knowledge and accomplishments far beyond the common standard of his day. Chaucer at this period possessed also other qualities fitted to recommend him to favor in a court like that of Edward the Third. 
Yuri describes him, on the authority of a portrait, as being then of fair, beautiful complexion, his lips red and full, his size of a just medium, and his port and air graceful and majestic. So continues the ardent biographer, so every ornament that could claim the approbation of the great and fair, his abilities to record the valor of the one and celebrate the beauty of the other, and his wit and gentle behavior to converse with both, conspired to make him a complete courtier. If we believe that his court of love had received such publicity as the literary media of the time allowed in the somewhat narrow and select literary world, not to speak of Troilus and Cressida, which, as Lydgate mentions, is first among Chaucer's works, some have supposed to be a youthful production. We find a third and not less powerful recommendation to the favor of the great cooperating with his learning and his gallant bearing. Elsewhere, reasons have been shown for doubt whether Trollius and Cressida should not be assigned to a later period of Chaucer's life, but very little is positively known about the dates and sequence of his various works. In the year 1386, being called as witness with regard to a contest on a point of heraldry between Lord Scrope and Sir Robert Grosvenor, Chaucer deposed that he entered on his military career in 1359. In that year, Edward III invaded France for the third time in pursuit of his claim to the French crown, and we may fancy that in describing the embarkation of the knights in Chaucer's dream, the poet gained some of the vividness and stir of his picture from his recollections of the embarkation of the splendid and well-appointed royal host at Sandwich, on board the eleven hundred transports provided for the enterprise. In this expedition the laurels of Poitiers were flung on the ground. After vainly attempting Rennes and Paris, Edward was constrained by cruel weather and lack of provisions to retreat toward his ships. The fury of the elements made the retreat more disastrous than an overthrow in pitched battle. Horses and men perished by the thousands, or fell into the hands of the pursuing French. Chaucer, who had been made a prisoner at the siege of Retter, was among the captives in the possession of France when the Treaty of Brittany, the Great Peace, was concluded. In May 1360. Returning to England, as we may suppose, at the peace, the poet, ere long, fell into another and a pleasanter captivity, for his marriage is generally believed to have taken place shortly after his release from foreign durance. He had already gained the personal friendship and favor of John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, the king's son, the duke, while Earl of Richmond had courted and won to wife after a certain delay, Blanche, daughter and co-heiress of Henry, Duke of Lancaster, and Chaucer is by some believed to have written the Assembly of Fowls to celebrate the wooing, as he wrote Chaucer's dream to celebrate the wedding of his patron. The marriage took place in 1359, the year of Chaucer's expedition to France, and, as in the Assembly of Fowls, the formal or female eagle, who is supposed to represent the Lady Blanche, begs that her choice of a mate may be deferred for a year. 1358 and 1359 have been assigned as the respective dates of the two poems already mentioned. In the dream, Chaucer prominently introduces his own lady love, to whom, after the happy union of his patron with the Lady Blanche, he is wedded amid great rejoicing and various expressions in the same poem show that not only was the poet high in favor with the illustrious pair, but that his future wife had also peculiar claims on their regard. She was the younger daughter of Sir Payne Roet, a native of Hainault, who had, like many of his countrymen, been attracted to England by the example and patronage of Queen Philippa. The favorite attendant on the Lady Blanche was her elder sister, Catherine, subsequently married to Sir Hugh Swinford, a gentleman of Lincolnshire, and destined, after the death of Blanche, to be in succession governess of her children, mistress of John of Gaunt, and lawfully wedded Duchess of Lancaster. 
It is quite sufficient proof that Chaucer's position at court was of no mean consequence to find that his wife, the sister of the future Duchess of Lancaster, was one of the royal maids of honour, and even, as Sir Harris Nicholas conjectures, a goddaughter of the Queen, for her name was also Philippa. Between 1359, when the poet himself testifies that he was made prisoner while bearing arms in France, and September 1366, when Queen Philippa granted her former maid of honour, by the name of Philippa Chaucer, a yearly pension of ten marks, or six pounds thirteen shillings four pence, we have no authentic mention of Chaucer, express or indirect. It is plain from this grant that the poet's marriage with Sir Payne Roet's daughter was not celebrated later than 1366. The probability is that it closely followed the return from the wars. In 1367, Edward III settled upon Chaucer a life pension of twenty marks for the good service which our beloved valet, Delectius Valetus Noster, Geoffrey Chaucer has rendered, and will render in time to come. Camden explains Valetus Hospiti to signify a gentleman of the privy chamber. Selden says that the designation was bestowed upon young heirs designed to be knighted, or young gentlemen of great descent and quality. Whatever the strict meaning of the word, it is plain that the poet's position was honorable and near to the king's person, and also that his worldly circumstances were easy, if not affluent, for it need not be said that twenty marks in those days represented twelve or twenty times the sum in these. It is believed that he found powerful patronage, not merely from the Duke of Lancaster and his wife, but from Margaret, Countess of Pembroke, the king's daughter. To her Chaucer is supposed to have addressed the goodly ballad in which the lady is celebrated under the image of the daisy. Her he is by some understood to have represented under the title of Queen Alcestis in the Court of Love, and the prologue to The Legend of Good Women, and in her praise we may read his charming descriptions and eulogies of the daisy, French Marguerite, the name of his royal patroness. To this period of Chaucer's career we may probably attribute the elegant and courtly, if somewhat conventional, poems of The Flower and the Leaf, The Cuckoo and the Nightingale, etc., the Lady Margaret, says Uri, would frequently compliment him on his poems, but this is not to be meant of his Canterbury Tales, they being written in the latter part of his life, when the courtier and the fine gentleman gave way to solid sense and plain descriptions. In his love-pieces he was obliged to have the strictest regard to modesty and decency, the ladies at that time insisting so much on the nicest punctilios of honour, that it was highly criminal to deprecate their sex, or do anything that might offend virtue. Chaucer, in their estimation, had sinned against the dignity and honour of womankind by his translation of the French Romain de la Rose, and by his Troilus and Cressida assuming it to have been among his less mature works, and to atone for those offences the Lady Margaret, though other and older accounts say it was the first queen of Richard II, Anne of Bohemia, prescribed to him the task of writing The Legend of Good Women. About this period, too, we may place the composition of Chaucer's ABC, or The Prayer of Our Lady, made at the request of the Duchess Blanche, a lady of great devoutness in her private life. She died in 1369, and Chaucer, as he had allegorized her wooing, celebrated her marriage, and aided her devotions, now lamented her death in a poem entitled The Book of the Duchess, or The Death of Blanche. In 1370 Chaucer was employed on the king's service abroad, and in November 1372 by the title of Suctifer Noster, our esquire or shield-bearer, he was associated with Jacobus Pronan and Johannes de Mari Sibis Janususis 
in a royal commission bestowing full powers to treat with the Duke of Genoa, his council and state. The object of the embassy was to negotiate upon the choice of an English port at which the Genoese might form a commercial establishment, and Chaucer, having quitted England in December, visited Genoa and Florence, and returned to England before the end of November 1373, for on that day he drew his pension from the exchequer in person. The most interesting point connected with this Italian mission is the question whether Chaucer visited Petrarch at Padua. That he did is unhesitatingly affirmed by the old biographers, but the authentic notices of Chaucer during the years 1372 and 1373, as shown by the researches of Sir Harris Nicholas, are confined to the facts already stated and we are left to answer the question by the probabilities of the case, and by the aid of what faint light the poet himself affords. We can scarcely fancy that Chaucer, visiting Italy for the first time in a capacity which opened for him easy access to the great and famous, did not embrace the chance of meeting a poet whose works he evidently knew in their native tongue and highly esteemed. With Mr. Wright we are strongly disinclined to believe that Chaucer did not profit by the opportunity of improving his acquaintance with the poetry, if not the poets, of the country he thus visited, whose influence was now being felt on the literature of most countries of Western Europe. That Chaucer was familiar with the Italian language appears not merely from his repeated selection as envoy to Italian states, but by many passages in his poetry from Assembly of Fowls to the Canterbury Tales. In the opening of the first poem there is a striking parallel to Dante's inscription on the gate of hell. The first song of Trollius, in Trollius and Cressida, is a nearly literal translation of Petrarch's 88th sonnet. In the prologue to The Legend of Good Women, there is a reference to Dante which can hardly have reached the poet at second hand, and in Chaucer's great work, as in The Wife of Bath's Tale and The Monk's Tale, direct reference by name is made to Dante, the wise poet of Florence, the great poet of Italy, as the source whence the author has quoted. When we consider the poet's high place in literature, and at court, which could not fail to make him free of the hospitalities of the brilliant little Lombard states, his familiarity with the tongue and the works of Italy's greatest bards, dead and living, the reverential regard which he paid to the memory of great poets, of which we have examples in The House of Fame, and at the close of Trollius and Cressida, along with his own testimony in the prologue to The Clerk's Tale, we cannot fail to construe that testimony as a declaration that the tale was actually told to Chaucer by the lips of Petrarch in 1373, the very year in which Petrarch translated it into Latin from Boccaccio's Decameron. Mr. Bell notes the objection to this interpretation, that the words are put into the mouth not of the poet but of the clerk, and meets it by the counter-objection that the clerk, being a purely imaginary personage, could not have learned the story at Padua from Petrarch, and therefore that Chaucer must have departed from the dramatic assumption maintained in the rest of the dialogue. Instances could be adduced from Chaucer's writings to show that such a sudden departure from the dramatic assumption would not be unexampled. Witness the aside in the Wife of Bath's prologue, where, after the jolly dame has asserted that, half so boldly, where can no man swear and lie as woman can, the poet hastens to interpose in his own person these two lines. I say not this by wives that be wise, but if it be when they them misadvise. And again in the prologue of The Legend of Good Women, from a description of the daisy. She is the clearness and the very light that in this dark world me guides and leads. The poet, in the very next line, slides into an address to his lady. The heart within my sorrowful heart you dreads and loves so sore that ye be verily the mistress of my wit, and nothing I. 
When, therefore, the clerk of Oxford is made to say that he will tell a tale, the which that I learned at Padua of a worthy clerk, as proved by his words and his work, he is now dead and nailed in his chest. I pray to God give his soul good rest. Francis Petrarch, the laureate poet, hight this clerk, whose rhetoric so sweet illumined all Italy of poetry. But forth to tellen of this worthy man that taught me this tale, as I began. We may without violent effort believe that Chaucer speaks in his own person, though dramatically the words are on the clerk's lips. And the belief is not impaired by the sorrowful way in which the clerk lingers on Petrarch's death, which would be less intelligible if the fictitious narrator had only read the story in the Latin translation than if we suppose the news of Petrarch's death at Arcua in July of 1374 to have closely followed Chaucer to England, and to have cruelly and irresistibly mingled itself with our poet's personal recollections of his great Italian contemporary. Nor must we regard as without significance the manner in which the clerk is made to distinguish between the body of Petrarch's tale and the fashion in which it was set forth in writing, with a poem that seemed a thing impertinent, save that the poet had chosen in that way to convey his matter, told or taught so much more directly and simply by word of mouth. It is impossible to pronounce positively on the subject. The question whether Chaucer saw Petrarch in 1373 must therefore remain a moot point, so long as we have only our present information, but fancy loves to dwell on the thought of the two poets conversing under the vines at Arcua, and we find in the history of the writings of Chaucer nothing to contradict, a good deal to countenance, the belief that such a meeting occurred. Though we have no express record, we have indirect testimony that Chaucer's Genoese mission was discharged satisfactorily, for on the 23rd of April, 1374, Edward the Third grants at Windsor to the poet, by the title of Our Beloved Squire, Dilecto Armigero Nostro, Unum Sicer, Vini, one pitcher of wine, daily to be perceived in the port of London, a grant which, on the analogy of more modern usage, might be held equivalent to Chaucer's appointment as Poet Laureate. When we find that soon afterwards the grant was commuted for a money payment of twenty marks per annum, we need not conclude that Chaucer's circumstances were poor, for it may be easily supposed that the daily perception of such an article of income was attended with considerable prosaic inconvenience. A permanent provision for Chaucer was made on the 8th of June, 1374, when he was appointed controller of the customs in the port of London, for the lucrative imports of wools, skins, or wool fells and tanned hides, on condition that he should fulfill the duties of that office in person, and not by deputy, and should write out the accounts with his own hand. We have what seems evidence of Chaucer's compliance with these terms in the House of Fame, where, in the mouth of the eagle, the poet describes himself, when he has finished his labor and made his reckonings, as not seeking rest and news in social intercourse, but going home to his own house, and there, all so dumb as any stone, sitting at another book, until his look is dazed, and again, in the record that in 1376 he received a grant of 731 pounds, four shillings, sixpence, the amount of a fine levied on one John Kent, whom Chaucer's vigilance had frustrated in the attempt to ship a quantity of wool for Dordrecht without paying the duty, the seemingly derogatory condition that the controller should write out the accounts or rolls, rotulus, of the office with his own hand, appears to have been designed or treated as merely formal. No records in Chaucer's handwriting are known to exist, which could hardly be the case if, for the twelve years of his controllership, 1374 through 1386, he had duly complied with the condition, and during that period he was more than once employed abroad, so that the condition was evidently regarded as a formality even by those who had imposed it. 
Also, in 1374, the Duke of Lancaster, whose ambitious views may well have made him anxious to retain the adhesion of a man so capable and accomplished as Chaucer, changed into a joint life annuity remaining to the survivor, and charged on the revenues of the Savoy a pension of ten pounds, which two years before he settled on the poet's wife, whose sister was then the governess of the duke's two daughters, Philippa and Elizabeth, and the duke's own mistress. Another proof of Chaucer's personal reputation and high court favor at the time is his selection in 1375 as ward to the son of Sir Edmund Staplegate of Bilsington in Kent, a charge on the surrender of which the guardian received no less a sum than one hundred four pounds. We find Chaucer in 1376 again employed in a foreign mission. In 1377, the last year of Edward III, he was sent to Flanders with Sir Thomas Percy, afterwards Earl of Worcester, for the purpose of obtaining a prolongation of the truce, and in January 1378 he was associated with Sir Gouchard Dongle and his commissioners to pursue certain negotiations for a marriage between Princess Mary of France and the young King Richard II which had been set on foot before the death of Edward III. The negotiation, however, proved fruitless, and in May of 1378 Chaucer was selected to accompany Sir John Barclay on a mission to the court of Bernardo Visconti, Duke of Milan, with the view, it is supposed, of concerting military plans against the outbreak of war with France. The new king, meantime, had shown that he was not insensible to Chaucer's merit, or to the influence of his tutor and the poet's patron, the Duke of Lancaster, for Richard the Second confirmed to Chaucer his pension of twenty marks, along with an equal annual sum for which the daily pitcher of wine granted in 1374 had been commuted. Before his departure for Lombardy, Chaucer, still holding his post in the customs, selected two representatives or trustees to protect his estate against legal proceedings in his absence, or to sue in his name defaulters and offenders against the imports which he was charged to enforce. One of these trustees was called Richard Forrester, the other was John Gower, the poet, the most famous English contemporary of Chaucer, with whom he had for many years been on terms of admiring friendship, although from the strictures based on certain productions of Gower's in the prologue of The Man of Law's Tale, it has been supposed that in the later years of Chaucer's life the friendship suffered some diminution. To the moral Gower and the philosophical Strode, Chaucer directed or dedicated his Trullius and Cressida, while in the Confessio Amantis, Gower introduces a handsome compliment to his greater contemporary as the disciple of the poet of Venus, with whose glad songs and ditties made her praise during the flowers of his youth. The land was filled everywhere. Gower, however, a monk and a conservative, held to the party of the Duke of Gloucester, the rival of the Withcliffiate and innovating Duke of Lancaster, who was Chaucer's patron, and whose cause was not a little aided by Chaucer's strictures on the clergy. And thus it is not impossible that political differences may have weakened the old bonds of personal friendship and poetic esteem. Returning from Lombardy early in 1379, Chaucer seems to have been again sent abroad, for the records exhibit no trace of him between May and December of that year. Whether by proxy or in person, however, he received his pensions regularly until 1382, when his income was increased by his appointment to the post of controller of petty customs in the Port of London. In November of 1384, he obtained a month's leave of absence on account of his private affairs, and a deputy was appointed to fill his place, and in February of the next year he was permitted to appoint a permanent deputy, thus at length gaining relief from that close attention to business which probably curtailed the poetic fruits of the poet's most powerful years. Chaucer is next found occupying a post which has not often been held by men gifted with his particular genius, that of a county member. 
the contest between the Dukes of Gloucester and Lancaster and their inheritance for the control of the government was coming to a crisis, and when the recluse and studious Chaucer was induced to offer himself to the electors of Kent as one of the knights of their share, where presumably he held property, we may suppose that it was with the view of supporting his patron's cause in the impending conflict. The Parliament, in which the poet sat, assembled at Westminster on the 1st of October, and was dissolved on the 1st of November, 1386. Lancaster was fighting and intriguing abroad, absorbed in the affairs of his Castilian succession. Gloucester and his friends, at home, had everything their own way. The Earl of Suffolk was dismissed from the Woolsack and impeached by the Commons, and although Richard at first stood out courageously for the friends of his uncle Lancaster, he was constrained by the refusal of supplies to consent to the proceedings of Gloucester. A commission was wrung from him under protest appointing Gloucester, Arundel, and twelve other peers and prelates a permanent council to inquire into the condition of all the public departments, the courts of law, and the royal household, with absolute powers of redress and dismissal. We need not ascribe to Chaucer's parliamentary exertions in his patron's behalf, nor to any malpractices of his official conduct, the fact that he was among the earliest victims of the commission. In December 1386 he was dismissed from both his offices in the port of London, but he retained his pensions, and drew them regularly, twice a year at the Exchequer, until 1388. In 1387 Chaucer's political reverses were aggravated by a severe domestic calamity. His wife died, and with her died the pension which had been settled on her by Queen Philippa in 1366, and confirmed to her at Richard's accession in 1377. The change made in Chaucer's pecuniary position by the loss of his offices and his wife's pension must have been very great. It would appear that during his prosperous times he had lived in a style quite equal to his income, and had no ample resources against a season of reverse, for on the 1st of May, 1388, less than a year and a half after being dismissed from customs, he was constrained to assign his pensions by surrender in chancery to one John Scalby. In May, 1389, Richard II, now of age, abruptly resumed the reins of government, which, for more than two years, had been ably but cruelly managed by Gloucester. The friends of Lancaster were once more supreme in the royal councils, and Chaucer speedily profited by the change. On the 12th of July he was appointed clerk of the King's Works at the Palace of Westminster, the Tower, the royal manors of Kennington, Eltham, Clarendon, Sheen, Byfleet, Children Langley, and Feckenham, the castle at Berkhamstead, the royal lodge at Hathenburg in the New Forest, the lodges in the parks of Clarendon, Children Langley, and Feckingham, and the mews for the king's falcons at Charing Cross. He received a salary of two shillings per day, and was allowed to perform the duties by deputy. For some reason unknown, Chaucer held this lucrative office little more than two years, quitting it before the 16th of September, 1391, at which date it had passed into the hands of one John Gedney. The next two years and a half are blank, so far as authentic records are concerned. Chaucer is supposed to have passed them in retirement, probably devoting them principally to the composition of the Canterbury Tales. In February 1394 the king conferred upon him a grant of twenty pounds a year for life, but he seems to have had no other source of income, and to have become embarrassed by debt, for frequent memoranda of small advances on his pension show that his circumstances were, in comparison, greatly reduced. Things appear to have grown worse and worse for the poet, for in May 1398 he was compelled to obtain from the king letters of protection against arrest, extending over a term of two years. Not for the first time, it is true, for similar documents had been issued at the beginning of Richard's reign, but at that time Chaucer's missions abroad, 
and his responsible duties in the port of London, may have furnished reasons for securing him against annoyance or frivolous prosecution, which were wholly wanting at a later date. In 1398, fortune began again to smile on him. He received a royal grant of a ton of wine annually, the value being about four pounds. Next year, Richard II, having been deposed by the son of John of Gaunt, Henry of Bolingbroke, Duke of Lancaster, the new king, four days after his accession, bestowed on Chaucer a grant of forty marks, twenty-six pounds, thirteen shillings, fourpence, per annum, in addition to the pension of twenty pounds conferred by Richard II in 1394. But the poet, now seventy-one years of age, and probably broken down by the reverses of the past few years, was not destined long to enjoy his renewed prosperity. On Christmas Eve of 1399 he entered on the possession of a house in the garden of the Chapel of the Blessed Mary of Westminster, near to the present site of Henry the Seventh's chapel, having obtained a lease from Robert Hermedesworth, the monk of the adjacent convent, for fifty-three years at an annual rent of four marks, two pounds, thirteen shillings, fourpence. Until the first of March, fourteen hundred, Chaucer drew his pensions in person. Then they were received for him by another hand, and on the twenty-fifth of October in the same year he died at the age of seventy-two. The only lights thrown by his poems on the closing days are furnished in a little ballad called Good Counsel of Chaucer, which, though they were said to have been written when, upon his deathbed lying in his great anguish, breathes the very spirit of courage, resignation, and philosophic calm, and by the retractation at the end of the Canterbury Tales, which, if it was not foisted in by monkish transcribers, may be supposed the effect of Chaucer's regrets and self-reproaches on that solemn review of his life-work, which the close approach of death compelled. The poet was buried in Westminster Abbey, and not many years after his death the slab was placed on a pillar near his grave, bearing the lines taken from the epitaph or eulogy made by Stephanus Sigurius of Milan at the request of Caxton, Galfridus Chaucer, Vates, et fama poesis, materne hoc sucrosum, tumultuous umo. Around 1555, Mr. Nicholas Brigham, a gentleman of Oxford, who greatly admired the genius of Chaucer, erected the present tomb, as near to the spot where the poet lay before the chapel of St. Bennet, as was then possible by reason of the cancelli, which the Duke of Buckingham subsequently obtained leave to remove, that room might be made for the tomb of Dryden. On the structure of Mr. Brigham, besides a full-length representation of Chaucer, taken from a portrait drawn by his scholar, Thomas O'Clave, was, or is, though now almost illegible, the following inscription. M. S. Qui fuit anglorum vates ter maximis olum, Galfridus Chaucer, conditur hoc tumulo, anum si queres domini, si tempora vitae, ece note substunt, que tibi chunca notant, 25 Octobris, 1400, er nirmanum requis mors, en brigam host fecit, musarem nomni sumptus, 1556. Concerning his personal appearance and habits, Chaucer has not been reticent in his poetry. Uri sums up the traits of his aspect and character fairly thus. He was of a middle stature, the latter part of his life inclinable to be fat and corpulent, as appears by the hosts bantering him in his journey to Canterbury, and comparing shapes with him. His face was fleshy, his features just and regular, his complexion fair and somewhat pale, his hair of a dusky yellow, short and thin, the hair of his beard in two forked tufts of a wheat color, his forehead broad and smooth, his eyes inclining usually to the ground, which is intimated by his host's words, 
his whole face full of liveliness, a calm, easy sweetness, and a studious, venerable aspect. As to his temper, he was a mixture of the gay, the modest, and the grave. The sprightliness of his humor was more distinguished by his writings than by his appearance, which gave occasion to Margaret, Countess of Pembroke, often to rally him upon his silent modesty in company, telling him that his absence was more agreeable to her than his conversation, since the first was productive of agreeable pieces of wit in his writings. But the latter was filled with a modest deference, and too distant respect. We see nothing merry or jocose in his behavior with his pilgrims, but a silent attention to their mirth rather than any mixture of his own. While disengaged from public affairs, his time was entirely spent in study and reading. So agreeable to him was this exercise that he says he preferred it to all other sports and diversions. He lived within himself, neither desirous to hear, nor busy to concern himself with the affairs of his neighbors. His course of living was temperate and regular. He went to rest with the sun and rose before it, and by that means enjoyed all the pleasures of the better part of the day, his morning walk and fresh contemplations. This gave him the advantage of describing the morning in so lively a manner as he does everywhere in his works. The springing sun glows warm in his lines, and the fragrant air blows cool in his descriptions. We smell the sweets of the bloomy halls, and hear the music of the feathered choir, wherever we take a forest walk with him. The hour of the day is not easier to be discovered from the reflection of the sun in Titian's paintings than in Chaucer's morning landscapes. His reading was deep and extensive, his judgment sound and discerning. In one word, he was a great scholar, a pleasant wit, a candid critic, a sociable companion, a steadfast friend, a grave philosopher, a temperate economist, and a pious Christian. Chaucer's most important poems are Trollius and Cressida, The Romant of the Rose, and The Canterbury Tales. Of the first, containing 8,246 lines, an abridgment with a prose connecting outline of the story is given in this volume, with the second, consisting of 7,699 octosyllabic verses, like those in which the House of Fame is written, it is found impossible to deal with in the present edition. The poem is a curtailed translation from the French Roman de la Rose, commenced by Guillaume de Loris, who died in 1260 after contributing 4,070 verses, and completed in the last quarter of the 13th century by Jean de Meun, who added some 18,000 verses. It is a satirical allegory, in which the vices of courts, the corruptions of the clergy, the disorders and inequalities of society in general are unsparingly attacked, and the most revolutionary doctrines are advanced, and though in making his translation Chaucer softened or eliminated much of the satire in the poem, still it remained in his verse a caustic exposure of the abuses of the time, especially those which discredited the church. The Canterbury Tales are presented in this edition with as near an approach to completeness in regard for the popular character of the volume permitted. The 17,385 verses of which the poetical tales consist have been given without abridgment or purgation, save in a single couplet, but the main purpose of the volume being to make the general reader acquainted with the poems of Chaucer and Spencer, the editor has ventured to contract the two prose tales, Chaucer's Tale of Melobius and the Parson's Sermon or Treatise on Penitence, so as to save about thirty pages for the introduction of Chaucer's minor pieces. At the same time, by giving prose outlines of those omitted parts, it has been sought to guard the reader against the fear that he was losing anything essential or even valuable. It is almost needless to describe the plot, or point out the literary place of the Canterbury Tales. 
Perhaps in the entire range of ancient and modern literature there is no work that so clearly and freshly paints for future times the picture of the past. Certainly no Englishman has ever approached Chaucer in the power of fixing forever the fleeting traits of his own time. The plan of the poem had been adopted before Chaucer chose it, notably in the Decameron of Boccaccio, although there the circumstances under which the tales were told, with the terror of the plague hanging over the merry company, lent a grim grotesqueness to the narrative, unless we can look at it abstracted from its setting. Chaucer, on the other hand, strikes a perpetual keynote of gaiety whenever he mentions the word pilgrimage, and at every stage of the connecting story we bless the happy thought which gives us the incessant incident, movement, variety, and unclouded but never monotonous joyousness. The poet, the evening before he starts on a pilgrimage to the shrine of St. Thomas at Canterbury, lies at the Tabard Inn in Southwark, curious to know in what companionship he is destined to fare forward on the morrow. Chance sends him nine and twenty in a company, representing all orders of English society, lay and clerical, from the knight and the abbot down to the ploughman and the sompador. The jolly host of the Tabard, after supper, when tongues are loosed and hearts are opened, declares that not this year he has seen with such company at once under its roof tree, and proposes that, when they set out the next morning, he should ride with them and make them sport. All agree, and Harry Bailey unfolds his scheme. Each pilgrim, according to the poet, shall tell two tales on the road to Canterbury, and two on the way back to London, and he whom the general voice pronounces to have told the best tale shall be treated to supper at the common cost, and, of course, to mine host's profit, when the cavalcade returns from the saint's shrine to the Southwark hostelry. All joyously assent, and early on the morrow, in the gay spring sunshine, they ride forth, listening to the heroic tale of the brave and gentle knight who has been gracefully chosen by the host to lead the spirited competition of the storytelling. To describe thus the nature of the plan, and to say that when Chaucer conceived, or at least began to execute it, he was between sixty and seventy years of age, is to proclaim that the Canterbury Tales could never be more than a fragment. Thirty pilgrims, each telling two tales on the way out, and two more on the way back, that makes one hundred twenty tales, to say nothing of the prologue, the description of the journey, the occurrences at Canterbury, and all the remnant of their pilgrimage, which Chaucer also undertook. No more than twenty-three of the one hundred twenty stories are told in the work as it comes down to us. That is, only twenty-three of the thirty pilgrims tell the first of the two stories on the road to Canterbury, while of the stories on the return journey we have not one, and nothing is said about the doings of the pilgrims at Canterbury, which would, if treated like the scene at the Tabard, have given us a still livelier picture of the period. But the plan was too large, and although the poet had some reserves in stories which he had already composed in an independent form, death cut short his labor ere he could even complete the arrangement and connection of more than a very few of the tales. Incomplete as it is, however, the magnum opus of Chaucer was in its own time received with immense favor. Manuscript copies are numerous, even now, no slight proof of its popularity, and when the invention of printing was introduced into England by William Caxton, the Canterbury Tales issued from his press in the year after the first English printed book, The Game of Cheese, had been struck off. Innumerable editions have since been published, and it may fairly be affirmed that few books have been so much in favor with the reading public of every generation as this book, which the lapse of every generation has been rendering more unreadable. Apart from the Romant of the Rose, no really important poetical work of Chaucer's is omitted from or unrepresented in the present edition. 
Of the legend of good women, the prologue only is given, but it is the most genuinely Chaucerian part of the poem. Of the court of love, three-fourths are here presented. Of the assembly of fowls, the cuckoo and the nightingale, the flower and the leaf, all of Chaucer's dream, one-fourth of the house of fame, two-thirds, and of the minor poems such a selection as may give an idea of Chaucer's power in the occasional department of verse. Necessarily, no space whatever could be given to Chaucer's prose works, his translation of Berthius's treatise on the consolation of philosophy, his treatise on the astrolabe, written for the use of his son Lewis, and his testament of love composed in his later years, and reflecting the troubles that then beset the poet. If, after studying in a simplified form the salient works of England's first great bard, the reader is tempted to regret that he was not introduced to a wider acquaintance with the author, the purpose of the editor will have been more than attained. The plan of the volume does not demand an elaborate examination into the state of our language when Chaucer wrote, or the nice questions of grammatical and metrical structure which conspire with the obsolete orthography to make his poems a sealed book for the masses. The most important element in the proper reading of Chaucer's verses, whether written in the decasyllabic or heroic meter, which he introduced to our literature, or in the octosyllabic measure, used with such animated effect in The House of Fame, Chaucer's Dream, etc., is the sounding of the terminal E, where it is now silent. The letter is still valid in French poetry, and Chaucer's lines can be scanned only by reading them as we would read Racine's or Moliere's. The terminal E played an important part in grammar. In many cases it was a sign of the infinitive, the N being dropped from the end. At other times it pointed the distinction between singular and plural, between adjective and adverb. The pages that follow, however, being prepared from the modern English point of view, necessarily no account is taken of these distinctions, and the now silent E has been retained in the text of Chaucer only when required by the modern spelling or the exigencies of meter. Before a word beginning with a vowel, or with the letter H, the final E was almost without exception mute and in such cases, in the plural forms and infinitives of verbs, the terminal N was generally retained for the sake of euphony. No reader who is acquainted with the French language will find it hard to fall into Chaucer's accentuation, while, for such as are not, a simple perusal of the text according to the rules of modern verse should remove every difficulty. So ends The Life of Geoffrey Chaucer, from The Canterbury Tales and Other Poems of Geoffrey Chaucer, edited by D. Lang Purvis. The Canterbury Tales, The Prologue when that aperlis with his shower's swoot, the drought of March hath pierced to the root, and bathed every vein in such lacour, of which virtue engendered is the flower, when Zephyrus eke with his swoot a breath, inspired hath in every holt and heath, the tender crops in the youngest son hath in the ram his half coursey run, and small fowls make melody, that sleep in all the night with open eye, so pricketh them nature in their courages. Then long a folk to go on pilgrimages, and palmers for to seek strange strands, to fern hollows couth in sundry lands. And specially from every shire's end of England to Canterbury they wend, the holy blissful martyr for to seek, that them hath holpen when that they were sick. Befell that in that season on a day, in Southwark at the tabard as I lay, ready to wend in on my pilgrimage to Canterbury with devout courage, at night was come into that hostelry well nine and twenty in a company of sundry folk by adventure ye fall in fellowship and pilgrims were they all that toward canterbury would ride the chamber and the stables were wide and well we were in east at the best 
and shortly when the sun was to rest so had i spoken with them every one that i was of their fellowship anon and made forward early for to rise to take our way there as i you devise but natheless while i have time and space ere that i farther in this tale pace methinketh it accordant to reason to tell you all of the condition of each of them so as it seemed to me and which they were in and of what degree and eke in what array that they were in and at a night then will i first begin a night there was and that a worthy man that from the time that he first began to ridden out he loved chivalry truth and honour freedom and courtesy full worthy was he in his lord's war and thereto had he ridden no man far as well in christendom as in heathenness and ever honoured for his worthiness at alisander he was when it was won full often time he had the board begun above all nations in prussia in letua had he raised and in russia no christian man so oft of his degree in grenade at the siege eke had he be of algeser and ridden in belle marie at lays was he and at saddley when they were won and in the great sea at many a noble army had he be at mortal battles had he been fifteen and foughten for our faith at tremacine and lists thrice and i slain his foe this ilka worthy knight had been also some time with the lord of palaty against another heathen in turkey and evermore he had a sovereign price and though he was worthy he was wise and of his port as meek as is a maid he never yet no villainy nay said in all his life unto no man or wight he was a very perfect gentle knight but for to tell you of his array his horse was good but yet he was not gay of fustian he weared a jippon all besmottered with his hauberjan for he was late to come from his voyage and went afore to do his pilgrimage with him there was his son a young squire a lover and a lusty bachelor with locks crow as they were laid in press of twenty years of age he was i guess of his stature he was of even length and wonderly deliver and great of strength and he had been some time in chevachy in flanders in artois and picardy and borne him well as of so little space and hoped to stand in his lady's grace embroidered was he as it were med all full of fresh of flowers white and red singing he was or fluting all the day he was as fresh as is the month of may short was his gown with sleeves long and wide well could he sit on horse and fair a ride he could a songs make and well indite joust and eke dance as well portray and write so hot he loved that by night or tale he slept no more than doth the nightingale courteous he was lowly and serviceable and carved before his father at the table a yeoman had he and servants no mo at that time for him lestride so and he was clad in coat and hood of green a sheaf of peacock arrows bright and keen under his belt he bare full thriftily well could he dress his tackle yeomanly his arrows droop not with feathers low and in his hands he bare a mighty bow a nuthead had he with a brown visage of woodcraft could he well all the usage upon his arms he bare a gay bracer and by his side a sword and a buckler and on that other's side a gay dagger harnessed well and sharp as point of spear christopher on his breast of silver sheen and horn he bare the baldric was of green a forester was he soothly as i guess there was also a nun a prioress that of her smiling was full simple and coy her greatest oath was but by saint loy and she was clepid madam eglantine full well she sang the service divine and tuned in her nose full seemly in french she spake full fair and fettisly after the school of stratford at a bow for french of paris was to her unno at meta was she well you taught withal she let no morsel from her lippis fall nor wet her fingers in her sauce deep well could she carry a morsel and well keep that no drop a nay fell upon her breast and courtesy was set full much her lest her over lip a wipe she so clean that in her cup there was no farthing seen of grease when she drunken had her draught full seemly after her meat she wrought and sickerly she was of great disport and full pleasant and amiable of port and pained her to counterfeit a cheer of court and be a stately of manner 
and to behold in dignity of reverence. But for to speaken of her conscience, she was so charitable and so piteous, she would a-weep if that she saw a mouse caught in a trap, if it were dead or bled. Of small a hounds had she, that she fed with roasted flesh and milk and wastel bread. But sore she wept if one of them were dead, or if men smote it with a yard of smart. And all was conscience and tender heart. Full seemly her wimple ye pinched was, her nose tretis, her eye in gray as glass, her mouth full small, and there too soft and red, but sickerly she had a fair forehead. It was almost a span a brow, I trow, for hardly she was not undergrow. Full fetus was her cloak, as I was ware. Of small coral about her arm she bare a pair of beads, gauded all with green, and thereon hung a brooch of gold full sheen, on which first you written, in crown day, and after, Amor vincent omnia. Another nun also with her had she, that was her chapeline, and priestess three. A monk there was, a fair for the mastery, an outrider that loved venery, a manly man, to be an abbot able, for many a dainty horse had he in stable, and when he rode, men might his bridle hear jingling in a whistling wind as clear and eke as loud as doth the chapel bell, fair as his lord was keeper of the cell. The rule of St. Mary and of St. Benet, because that was old and some deal straight, this ilk a monk let older things pace, and held after the newer world the trace. He was not of the text a pulled hen that saith that hunters be not holy men, nay that a monk, when he is cloisterless, is like to a fish that is waterless. This is to say, a monk out of his cloister, the silk a text held he not worth an oyster, and I say his opinion was good. Why should he study and make himself wood upon a book and cloister always poor, or swink in with his hands, and labor as Austin bid? How shall the world be served? Let Austin have his swink to him reserved. Therefore he was a prickosaur all right, greyhounds he had as swift as fowl of flight. Of prickering and of hunting for the hare was all his lust, for no cost would he spare. I saw his sleeves are filled at the hand with gris, and that the finest of the land. And for to fasten his hood under his chin, he had of gold you wrought a curious pin, a love knot in the greater end there was. His head was bald, and shone as any glass, and eke his face, as it had been anoint. He was a lord full fat and in good point, his eye in steep and rolling in his head, that steamed as a furnace of a lead. His boots supple, his horse in great estate. Now certainly he was a fair prelate. He was not pale as a four-pined ghost. A fat swan loved he best of any roast. His palfrey was as brown as is a berry. A friar there was, a wanton and a merry, a limitor, a full solemn man. In all the orders four is none that can so much of dalliance in fair language. He had ye made full many a marriage of young women at his own cost. Unto his order he was a noble post, full well beloved, and familiar was he with Franklin's over all in his country, and eke with worthy women of the town, for he had power of confession, as said himself more than a curate, for of his order he was licentiate, full sweetly heard he confession, and pleasant was his absolution. He was an easy man to give penance, there as he wist to have a good pittance, for unto a poor order for to give is sign that a man is well ye shrive. For if he gave, he durst make a vaunt, he wist that the man was repentant. For many a man so hard is of his heart, he may not weep, although him sore smart. Therefore instead of weeping and prayers, men must give silver to the poor frères. His tippet was I farced full of knives and pins for to give to fair wives, and certainly he had a merry note. Well could he sing and play in on a rote. Of yettings he bare utterly the prize. His neck was white as is the fleur de lis. Thereto he strong was as a champion. He knew well the taverns in every town. And every hostler and gay tapster, better than a laser or a beggar, for unto such a worthy man as he accordeth not, as by his faculty, to have with such lasers acquaintance. It is not honest, it may not advance, as for to deal with no such poor ale, but all with rich and sellers of the tale. And over all there is profit should arise, 
courteous he was, and lowly of service, and as no man nowhere so virtuous. He was the best beggar in all his house, and gave a certain frame for the grant. None of his brethren came into his haunt, for though a widow had but one shoe, so pleasant was his in principio, yet he would have a farthing ere he went. His purchase was well better than his rent. And rage he could and play as any whelp in love days. There could he much'll help. For there was he not like a cloisterer, with threadbare scope as is a poor scholar, but he was like a master or a pope. Of double worsted was his semicope, that rounded him as a bell out of press. Somewhat he lisped for his wantonness, to make his English sweet upon his tongue, and in his harping, when that he had sung, his eye and twinkled in his head aright, as do the stars in a frosty night. This worthy limitor was called Hubert. A merchant was there with a forked beard, and motley, and high on his horse he sat, upon his head a flandrish beaver hat. His boots clasped fair and fetisly, his reason's eye spake he full solemnly, sounding alway the increase of his winning. He would the sea were kept for anything betwixt a Middleburg and Orwell. Well could he in exchange shields sell, this worthy man full well his wit beset. There wist in no wight that he was in debt, so as stately was he of governance with his bargains and with his chevisance. For sooth he was a worthy man withal, but sooth to say I not how men him call. A clerk there was of Oxenford also, that unto logic had a long ago, as Lena was his horse as is a rake, and he was not right fat, I undertake, but looked hollow, and there too soberly. Full threadbare was his overest courtpy, for he had not gotten him yet no benefice, nay was not worldly to have an office. For him was lever have at his bed's head twenty books, clothed in black or red, of Aristotle and his philosophy, and robes rich or fiddle or psaltery. But all be that he was a philosopher, yet had a he but little gold in coffer, but all that he might of his friends hent, on books and on learning he it spent, and busily gan for the soul's prey of them that gave him wherewith to scholae, of study took he most care and heed. Not one word spake he more than was need, and that was said in form and reverence, and short and quick, and full of high sentence, sounding in moral virtue was his speech, and gladly would he learn, and gladly teach. A sergeant of the law, wary and wise that often had ye been at the parvis there was also full rich of excellence discreet he was and of great reverence he seemed such his words were so wise just as he was full often in a size by patent and by plain commission for his science and for his high renown of fees and robes had he many one so great a purchaser was nowhere none all was fee simple to him in effect his purchasing might not be in suspect, nowhere so busy a man as he there was, and yet he seemed busier than he was, in terms had he case and doom as all that from the time of King Will were fall. Thereto he could indict, and make a thing there could a no white pinch at his writing, and every statute could he plain by rote. He rode but homely in a medley coat, girt with a scent of silk, with bare as small, of his array tell I no longer tala. A Franklin was in this company, white was his beard as is the daisy, of his complexion he was sanguine, well loved he in the morn a sop and wine, to live in and delight was ever his one, for he was Epicurus Owen's son, that held opinion in plain delight was verily felicity per fight, an householder, and that a great was he, St. Julian, he was in his country, his bread, his ale, was always after one. A better and vine man was nowhere none. Without bake meat never was his house. Of fish and flesh, and that so plenteous. It snowed in his house of meat and drink, Of all the dainties that men could have think. After the sundry seasons of the year, So changed he his meat and his super. Many full of fat partridge had he in mew, And many a bream, and many a loose stew. Woe was his cook, but if his sauce were poignant and sharp, and ready all his gear. His table dormant in his hall always stood ready covered all the long a day. At sessions there was he lord and sire. Full often time he was knight of the shire. An anlace and a gipsier, all of silk, hung at his girdle, white as morning milk. 
a sheriff had he been, and the contour was nowhere such a worthy vavasor. An haberdasher and a carpenter, a webba, a dyer, and a tapasser were with a seek, clothed in one livery, of a solemn and great fraternity. Full fresh and new their gear ye picked was, their knives were ye chipped not with brass, but all with silver wrought full clean and well, their girdles and their pouches every deal. Well seemed each of them a fair burgess, to sitten in a guild hall on the dais, ever reach for the wisdom that he can, was shapely for to be an alderman. For chattels had they enough and rent, and eke their wives would it well assent, and Ella certain that they had been to blame. It is full fair to be a clept madame, and for to go to vigils all before, and have a mantle royally bore. A cook they had with them for the knowns, to boil the chickens and the marrow bones, and powder merchant tart and gallingal, well could he know a drought of London ale. He could roast and stew and broil and fry, make more trues, and well bake a pie. But great harm was it, as it thought to me, that on his shin a mormal had a he. For Blanc Manger, that made he with the best. A shipman was there, one far by west, for aught I wot be was of Dartmouth. He rode upon a rouncy as he couth, all in a gown of falding to the knee. A dagger hanging by a lace had he about his neck under his arm adown. The hot summer had made his hue all brown. And certainly he was a good fellow. Full many a draught of wine had he a draw. From Bordeaux ward, while the chapmen sleep, of a nice conscience took he no keep. If that he fought, and had the higher hand, by water he sent them home to every land. But of his craft to reckon well his tides, his steams and his strand is him besides. His herberal, his moon, and laud manage, there was none such from hull unto Carthage. Hardly he was, and wise, I undertake, with many a tempest had his beard been shake. He knew well all the havens as they were, from Scotland to the Cape of Finister, in every creek in Bretagne and in Spain, his barge eclipsed was the Magdalene. With us there was a doctor of physic, and all of this world was there none him like, to speak of physic and of surgery, for he was grounded in astronomy. He kept his patient a full great deal in hours by his magic natural. Well could he fortune the ascendant of his images for his patient. He knew the cause of every malady, were it of cold or hot or moist or dry, and where engendered, and of what humor. He was a very perfect practiser, the cause, you know, and of his harm the root, and on he gave the sick man his boot, full ready had he his apothecaries, to send his drugs and his lecturies, for each of them made other for to win their friendship was not new to begin, well knew he the old Escalopus, and Dioscorides, and eke Rufus, old Hippocras, Holly, and Gallian, Serapion, Rassus, and Avicen, Averroes, Damascene, and Constantine, Bernard, and Gattiston, and Gilberton. Of his diet measurable was he, for it was of no superfluity, but of great nourishing and digestible. His study was but little on the Bible. In sanguine and in purse he glad was all, lined with taffeta and with sendal. And yet he was but easy of dispense, he kept that he won in the pestilence. For gold in physic is a cordial, therefore he loved gold in special. A good wife was there of beside bath, but she was some deal deaf, and that was scath. Of cloth making she had in such an haunt, she passed them of ipries and of gaunt. And all the parish wife was their nun, that to the offering before her should gone. And if there did, certain so wroth was she that she was out of all a charity. Her cover chiefs were full fine of ground. I durst to swear they weighed a ten pound, that on Sunday were upon her head. Her hosen were of fine scarlet red, full straight ye tied, and shoes full moist and new. Bold was her face, and fair and red of hue. She was a worthy woman all her life. Husbands at the church door had she had five, without an other company in youth. But thereof needeth not to speak as nooth. And thrice had she been at Jerusalem, she had a past many a strange stream. At Rome she had been, and at Boulogne, in Gallus and St. James, and at Cologne. She could a much of wandering by the way. Gat-toothed was she, soothly for to say, 
Upon an ambler easily she sat. He wimpled well, and on her head and hat as broad as is a buckler or a targe, a foot-mantle about her hips large, and on her feet a pair of spurs sharp. In fellowship well could she laugh and carp of remedies of love she knew perchance, for of that art she could the olde dance. A good man there was of religion, that was a poor parson of a town, but rich he was of holy thought and work, and he was also a learned man, a clerk, that Christ's gospel truly would he preach, his parishes devoutly would he teach. Benign he was, and wonder diligent, and in adversity full patient, and such he was he proved often scythes, full loth were him to curse for his tithes, but rather would he given out of doubt unto his poor parishions about, of his offering and eke of his substance. He would in little thing have sufficience, wider was his parish, and houses far asunder, but he nay left naught, for no rain nor thunder, in sickness and in mischief to visit the farthest in his parish, much and lit, upon his feet and in his hands a staff. This noble example to his sheep he gaff, that first he wrought, and afterward he taught. Out of the gospel he the word is caught, in this figure he added yet thereto, that if gold rust, what should iron do? For if a priest be foul, on whom we trust, no wonder is a lewd man to rust. And shame it is, if that a priest take keep, to see a shitten shepherd and clean sheep. Well ought a priest in sample for to give, by his own cleanness, how his sheep should live. He set a not his benefice to hire, and left his sheep encumbered in the mire, and ran unto London, unto St. Paul's, to seek him a shantery for souls, or with a brotherhood to be withhold. But dwelt at home, and kept a well his fold, so that the wolf nay made it not miscarry. He was a shepherd, and no mercenary. And though he holy were, and virtuous, he was to sinful men not dispiteous, nor of his speech a dangerous nor dine, but in his teaching discreet and benign. To drawn folk to heaven with fairness, by good ensample was his business, but it were any person obstinate, whatso he were of high or low estate, him would he snib a sharply for the knowns. A better priest I trow that nowhere none is. He waited after no pomp nor reverence, nor make him a spiced conscience. But Christ is Lord, and his apostles twelve he taught, and first he followed it himself. With him there was a ploughman, was his brother, that had he laid of dung full many a father, a true swinker and a good was he, living in peace and perfect charity. God loved he best with all his heart at all the times, were it gain or smart, and then his neighbor right as himself. He would a thresh and there to dyke and delve, for Christ's sake, for every poor wight, without an hire, if it lay in his might. His tithes paid he full fair and well, both of his proper swink and his chattel, and at a tabard he rode upon a mare. There was also a reeve and a millera, a sompner and a pardoner also, a manciple and myself. There were no mo. The miller was a stout carl for the knowns, full big he was of brawn and eke of bones. That proved well, for over all where he came, at wrestling he would bear away the rein. He was short-shouldered, broad, a thick at gar. There was no door that he hold heave off bar, or break it at a running with his head. His beard as any so or fox was red, and thereto broad, as though it were a spade. Upon the cop right of his nose he had a wart, and thereon stood a tuft of hairs red as the bristles of a sow's ear. His nose thurls black, were and wide, a sword and buckler bear he by his side. His mouth as wide as was a furnace. He was a jangler and a golardice, and that was most sin and harlotrize. Well could he steal a corn, and toll a thrice, and yet he had a thumb of gold, pardy. A white coat and a blue hood weared he. A bagpipe well could he blow and sound, and therewithal he brought us out of town. A gentle manciple was there of a temple, of which Akatur's might a take and sample, for to be wise and bine of vitail. For whether that he paid, or took by tail, Algate he waited so in his acate, that he was aye before in good estate. Now is not that of God a full fair grace, that such a lewd man as which shall pace the wisdom of, and heap of learned men. Of masters had he more than thrice ten, that were of law expert and curious, of which there was a dozen in that house, worthy to be stewards of rent and land of any lord that is in England. 
to make him live by his proper good in honor debtless but if he were would or live as scarcely as him list desire and able for to help in all a shire in any case that might a fall or hap and yet this manciple set their all our cap the reeve was a slender choleric man his beard was shaved as high as ever he can his hair was by his ears round you shorn his top was docked like a priest before full long over his legs and full lean e like a staff there was no calf you seen well could he keep a garner in a bin there was no auditor could on him win well wist he by the draught and by the rain the yielding of his seed and of his grain his lord's sheep his neat and his dairy his swine his horse his store and his poultry were wholly in this reeve's governing and by his covenant gave he reckoning since that his lord was twenty year of age there could no man bring him in a rearage there was no bailiff herd nor other hind that he ne knew his slight and his covine they were a drought of him as of the death his wanning was full fair upon and heath with green trees as shadowed was his place he could a better than his lord purchase full rich he was he stored privily his lord well could he please subtly to give and lend him of his own good and have a thank and yet a coat and hood in youth he learned had a good mister he was well good right a carpenter the shreve sat upon a right good stot that was all palmly gray in height a scot a long surcoat of purse upon he had and by his side he bare a rusty blade of norfolk was the shreve of which i tell beside a town man clepin baldswell tucked he was as is a friar about and never rode the hinderest of the rout Saltner was there with us in that place that had a fire red cherubin's face for sus flame he was with eye and narrow as hot he was and lecherous as a sparrow with scalloped brows black and pilled beard of his visage children were sore afeard and as quicksilver lithards nor brimstone borus cerus nor oil of tartar none nor ointment that would cleanse or bite that him might help him of his welkis white nor of the knobs sitting on his cheeks well loved he garlic onions and leeks and for to drink strong wine as red as blood then would he speak and cry as he were wood and when he well drunken had the wine then would he speak no word but latin a few terms knew he two or three that he had learned out of some decree no wonder is he heard it all the day and eke knowin well how the dj can clap and wat as well as can the pope but whoso would another thing him grope that he had spent all his philosophy i quistio quid juris would he cry he was a gentle harlot and a kind a better fellow should a man not find he would a suffer for a quart of wine a good fellow to have his concubine a twelvemonth and excuse him at the full full privily a finch eke could he pull and if he found oh where a good fellow he would teach him to have none awe in such a case as the archdeacon's curse but if a man's soul were in his purse for in his purse he should ye punished be purse is the archdeacon's hell said he but well i wot he lied right indeed of cursing not each guilty man to dread for curse will slay right as a sailing sabbath and also wear him of significat in danger had he at his own guise the younger girls of the diocese and knew their counsel and it was of their reed the garland had he set upon his head as great as if it were for an ale stake a buckler had he made him of a cake with him there rode a gentle pardoner of roncevaux his friend and his compare that straight was coming from the court of rome full loud he sang come hither love to me the sompner bare to him a stiff burden was never trump of half so great a sound this pardoner had hair as yellow as wax but smooth it hung as doth a strike of flax by ounces hung his locks that he had and therewith he his shoulders overspread full thin it lay by culpins one in one but hood for jollity he weared none for it was trussed up in his wallet him thought he rode all of the new agate dishevel save his cap he rode all bare such glaring eye and had he as in hair a vernicle had he sewed upon his cap his wallet lay before him in his lap fretful of pardon come from rome all hot a voice he had as small as hath a goat no beard had he nor ever one should have as smooth it was as it were new ye shave i trow he were a gelding or a mare 
but of his craft from berwick unto ware ne was there such another pardoner for in his mail he had a pillow bear which as he said was our lady's veil he said he had a gobbet of the sail that saint peter had when that he went upon the sea till jesus christ him hent he had a cross of latin fowl of stones and in a glass he had pig's bones but with these relics when that he fond a poor parson dwelling upon land upon a day he got him more money than the parson got in munneth's tway and thus with feigned flatterings and japes he made the parson and the people his apes but truly to tell in at the last he was in church a noble ecclesiast well could he read a lesson or a story but alderbast he sang an offertory for well he wista when that song was sung he must a preach and well afile his tongue to win silver as he right well could therefore he sang full merrily and loud now have i told you shortly in a clause the estate the array the number and eke the cause why that assembled was this company in southwark at this gentle hostelry that hita the tabard fast by the bell but now is time for you to tell how that we bear in us that ilken night when we were in that hostelry aright and after will i tell of our voyage and all the remnant of our pilgrimage but first i pray you of your courtesy that ye are it not my villainy though that i plainly speak in this matter to tell in you their words and their cheer not though i speak their words properly for this ye know and all so well as i whoso shall tell a tale after a man he must rehearse as nigh as ever he can every word if it be in his charge i'll speak he ne'er so rudely and so large or else he must tell his tale untrue or feign things or find a words new he may not spare although he were his brother he must as well say one word as another christ spake himself full broad and holy writ and well ye wot no villainy is it eke plato saith whoso that can him read the words must be cousin to the deed also i pray you to forgive it me as have i not set folk in their degree here in this tale is that they shouldn't stand my wit is short ye may well understand great cheer made our host us every one and to the supper set he us anon and served us with victual of the best strong was the wine and well to drink us lest a seemly man our host was withal for to have been a marshal in an hall a large man he was with eye and steep a fairer burgess is there none and cheap bold of his speech and wise and well he taught and of manhood a lacked him right naught eke thereto he was right a merry man and after supper playin he began and spake of mirth amongst other things when that we had a made our reckonings and said of us now lordings truly ye be to me welcome right heartily for by my troth if that i shall not lie i saw not this year such a company at once in this herbero the mizinel fain would i do you mirth and i wist how and of a mirth i am right now bethought to do you ease and it shall cost naught ye go to canterbury god you speed the blissful martyr quite you your mead and well i wot as ye go by the way ye shapen you to talken and to play for truly comfort nor mirth is none to ride by the way is dumb as stone and therefore would i make you disport as i said erst and do you some comfort and if you liketh all by one assent now for to stand in at my judgment and for to work in as i shall you say to-morrow when ye ride in on the way now by my father's soul that is dead but ye be merry smiteth off mine head hold up your hands without more speech our counsel was not long afore to seech us thought it was not worth to make it wise and granted him without more advice and bade him say his verdict as him lest lordings quoth he now hearken for the best but take it not i pray you in disdain this is the point to speak it plat and plain that each of you to shorten with your way in this voyage shall tell in tales tway to canterbury word i mean it so and homeward he shall tell in other two of adventures that willem have befall and which you that beareth him best of all that is to say that telleth in this case tales of best sentence and most solace shall have a supper at your aller cost here in this place sitting by this post when that ye come again from canterbury and for to make you the more merry i will myself gladly with you ride right at mine own cost and be your guide and whoso will my judgment with say shall pay for all we spend in by the way 
and if ye vouchsafe that it be so, tell me anon without words mo, and I will early shape me therefore. This thing was granted, and our oath we swore with full glad heart, and prayed him also that he would vouchsafe for to do so, and that he would be our governor, and of our tales judge and repertoire, and set a supper at a certain price, and we will ruled be at his device, in high and low, and thus by one assent we be accorded to his judgment, and thereupon the wine was fetten on, we drunken, and to rest went each one without any longer tarrying. A morrow, when the day began to spring, up rose our host, and was our allercock, and gathered us together in a flock, and forth we ridden all a little space unto the watering of St. Thomas. And there our host began his horse arrest, and said, Lords, hearken if you lest, to wheat your foreword, and I at record, if even song and morning song accord, let's see now who shall tell of the first tale. As ever may I drink a wine or ale, whoso is rebel to my judgment shall pay for all that by the way is spent. Now draw ye cuts, ere that ye farther twin, he which that hath the shortest shall begin. Sir Knight, quoth he, my master and my lord, now draw the cut, for that is mine accord. Come near, quoth he, my lady prioress, and ye, sir clerk, let be your shamefastness, nor study not, lay hand to every man. And on to draw, and every white began, and shortly for to tell and as it was, were it by a venture, or sort, or cost, the sooth is this, the cut fell to the knight, of which full blithe and glad was every white, and tell he must his tale as was reason, by foreword and by composition, as ye have heard. What needeth words mo? And when this good man saw that it was so, as he that wise was and obedient to keep his foreword by his free assent, he said, Sithen, I shall begin this game. Why welcome be the cut in God as name. Now let us ride, and hearken what I say. And with that word we ridden forth our way, and he began with right to merry cheer his tale anon, and said, as you shall hear. End of the General Prologue